Good morning. I can't quite remember what prompted me to offer this talk. I think at some point late last fall I was distressed about the confrontational nature of what passes for political discourse these days and thought maybe gracious space could help. And now there is another war in Europe that we see unfolding in real time, deepening the hopelessness some of us feel. The poem Neil Schwarzwalder shared on the listserv yesterday morning was timely. It begins, I can't make the world be peaceful. And it ends, I can't force peace in the world, but I can become a force of peace in the world. I learned about Gracious Space in Leadership Montana more than 10 years ago, and I've long felt that it could be a kind of spiritual practice. But I'm not really sure because I haven't found a good description of what a spiritual practice is. So let's just think of it as a personal practice. I hope it may also provide a way to start bridging differences in the larger world. The divides are so wide and so deep now, the attitudes on all sides so hard, that it seems scary and difficult to think about doing anything. Maybe that's a reason I wanted to put this talk together, to remind me of the possibilities and to dust off the tools. So what is gracious space? It is an approach developed by the Center for Ethical Leadership to provide healthy environment in which people and communities can grow. Other programs emphasize ways to send communication. For example, using I statements instead of saying you. Gracious space, in contrast, requires an openness to receiving and listening to what others have to say. The basic statement of gracious space names four pillars, a spirit, and a setting where we invite the stranger and embrace learning in public. To begin with the first dimension, gracious space would have us bring a spirit of trust, intention, compassion, and curiosity to any challenging conversation or problem-solving effort. In gracious space, we come intending to listen compassionately and trusting others to be open to our comments Curiosity here means openness and a deep desire to listen, to understand, and to learn. I think our UU chalice lightings, the opening words, help us come together in this spirit of trust, intention, compassion, and curiosity. Compassion reminds us that we are all in this together, that there are common hopes, dreams, and feelings. The gracious space spirit means to intend to bring compassion. While planning this service, I happened to discover that compassion does not get much space in our UU resources, at least as the hymns and readings are listed under compassion in the topical index at the back of our hymnal. The words themselves tend to be pretty general and emphasize warm, common feelings. Our closing hymn this morning, Let Freedom Span Both East and West, makes us a bit more active in creating compassion rather than just talking about it. I noticed that some UU compassion language even positions compassion with a, a slight edge of superiority when, for example, we sing or speak of binding the wounds of others or the idea of caring for those less fortunate. That doesn't exactly summon intent to be open and to be respectful of others. But the UU Soul Matters packet for this month included readings about empathy, which is a lot like compassion. This quote from writer Leslie Jameson actually foregrounds the gracious space spirit of intent. Empathy isn't just something that happens to us, a meteor shower of synapses firing across the brain. It's also a choice we make to pay attention, to extend ourselves. It's made of exertion, Sometimes we care for another because we know we should or because it's asked for, but this doesn't make our caring hollow. The act of choosing simply means we've committed ourselves to a set of behaviors greater than the sum of our individual inclinations. This confession of effort chafes against the notion that empathy should always rise unbidden, that genuine means the same thing as unwilled, but that intentionality is the enemy of love. 
But I believe in intention, and I believe in work. I believe in waking up in the middle of the night and packing our bags and leaving our worst selves for our better ones. Thus also with the spirit of gracious space, we come intending to trust, to be compassionate, to be curious about another person. If you come to a conversation, especially with someone whose views are categorically opposed to yours, seeking only to win an argument, you probably won't. In fact, I've heard that the harder you try to convince someone, the less likely you are to succeed. Most of my brother's social and political views are decidedly opposite to mine, but I don't want to fight with him or alienate him. So mostly we agree to disagree and then change the subject, but we do get into dis exchanges of questions and sometimes even facts. I feel like a coward, but trying to come, come with a spirit of trust and curiosity, at least as an aspiration, is calming. I don't present myself here as any kind of model of the spirit of gracious space, except maybe, I hope, in the Hippocratic Oath sense of trying to first do no harm. As its second pillar, gracious space reminds us that for people to feel comfortable enough to be open and trusting, there should be a gracious physical space. In a group setting, this means providing snacks, plenty of light, comfortable seating, and so on. We can't always choose our setting, but sometimes it doesn't take a lot. The Gracious Space book used in Leadership Montana had an anecdote about a manager who simply cleared off the side chair or the visitor's chair in her office. She had realized that her conversations with workmates were often brief and sometimes awkward. The simple hospitality of a place to sit changed the way others approached her. It doesn't take a lot to create a comfortable setting. An intangible, but I've begun to realize, essential part of the setting is time. Most leadership programs encourage you not to waste people's time. But I've learned, especially through meetings in our fellowship, that it is as unproductive to cram a 20-minute discussion into five minutes on an agenda as it is to drag out a quick, simple, uncontroversial five-minute item into 20 minutes. That worked out well in the initial, excuse me, that worked out well in the difficult discussion one of my sisters and I had with our mother in which she decided to move to assisted living. Despite my previous point about coming with a good intent, that particular conversation happened spontaneously as she was getting for ready for bed the night before I was to return to Bozeman. I texted my sister to come from down the block to join in. Mom was in her space, her own bedroom, and there was no time pressure on the conversation. We were able to talk until we had a plan. My other sister felt a little bit left out, but you know, if we had planned for all three of us to be there, it might not have gone so well. It would undoubtedly have been asymmetrical, and my mom could have become defensive. I guess that's another dimension of setting being aware of the number of participants. In my work life, I often consist considered the number of people on the various sides of a meeting, trying not to outcumber, outnumber the other party. Even in a family setting, I suppose, maybe you shouldn't gang up on the cousin wearing the MAGA hat, at least not if you can help it. Now we come to yet more challenging aspects of gracious space. It's two commitments. The first is known as inviting the stranger. The stranger means someone intriguing and different. It means special attention must be given to those who disagree or think differently so we can explore wide-ranging alternatives and find a bridge or a path forward. And if a, can, a stranger cannot be invited, as Reverend Nina Gray once suggested when we were planning discussions about our building options, we need to consider whose voice is not present. An absentee might not necessarily be a stranger, but looking for one makes the work more inclusive. Gracious Space would say that if the difference, the stranger, isn't naturally occurring or naturally present, we should invite it. A key step here is to identify the stranger. 
with my brother. I know his views are different or strange. But what does that difference mean? Difference doesn't mean worse, as we easily acknowledge in a lot of other cases. But we need to recognize that the stranger often brings a view we find challenging or even threatening. One gracious space leader in Montana told our Bozeman Leadership Montana alumni group once that she had made a commitment to herself to be the stranger at least three times in the coming year. That is breathtaking and brave. And I remember Rabbi Ed Staffman's sermon last summer when he spoke to us about religion in the legislature in a service at Bozeman Ponds. He mentioned that he had joined the state legislator's Bible study group, all the rest of them Christian conservatives, but him, again, breathtaking and brave. We don't all have to be the stranger, as these two people were, but we need to invite the stranger if we are to make progress in bridging divides. And here's a little take-home essay question. Can you think of a time when you were the stranger? And how did that work? Many faith traditions place a value on welcoming the stranger. Just last Thursday, a couple of days ago, there was an op-ed on welcoming the stranger in the New York Times by Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker of Congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, Texas. You know, the one who was held hostage with others in his own synagogue last month. He explains that, quote, the command to care for the stranger is mentioned at least 36 times in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, more than any other mitzvah or good deed. It's mentioned so often because we need the reminder, because it isn't natural. It is hard. Islam, too, has its own take on how to meet the stranger. A verse, verse from the Quran, verse 2563, is included in our newer book of readings, the Maroon one. And the servants of Allah most gracious are those who walk on the earth in humility. And when the ignorant address them, they say, peace. Rabbi Saitron Walker will forever bear the burden of having literally welcomed the gunman into his synagogue. He adds, still, I remain committed to the idea of welcoming and caring for the stranger and living that value. This is admirable, but gracious space would have us go beyond welcoming. It asks, asks us to invite the stranger, though probably not the one brandishing the gun. At least part of the problem with inviting the stranger is that we ourselves are sometimes strangers. Rabbi Citron Walker lists various ways we can all be strangers to one another and concludes that we're strangers because it takes too much work to be curious to give others the benefit of the doubt. It's a lot easier and more comfortable to stick with one's group. Love your neighbor is hard enough. And if welcoming is hard, inviting is even harder. Sometimes uninvited strangers reveal themselves in conversation and we find ourselves engaged with them anyway. If you find yourself thinking they've been duped or they're idiots or worse, you're talking with a stranger. So what do you do? Well, try to summit your spirit of intentional openness and try to tweak the setting by lowering the volume and slowing the pace of your own comments. And ask questions, real, open-ended questions. Trying to present facts, alas, may not work in this time of alternative facts and distrust of science and logic. When you find yourself in discussion with a stranger, someone with a radically different point of view, Gracious Space asks for one more commitment, being willing to learn in public. Learning occurs when we unfreeze our certainty, when we hear new information and reconsider our own experiences and knowledge. Learning in public allows us to share the burden of complex information and rapid change. In this sense, the stranger may actually be an ally rather than an enemy, in helping us deal with complexity. Being willing to unfreeze our certainty requires a leap of faith. It's almost like admitting you are wrong, which is hard. So those are the habits of a personal, if not spiritual, practice of gracious space. A spirit of intent, curiosity, and compassion. 
a comfortable setting, inviting the stranger, and learning in public. I have to say that all these are still aspirational practices for me um, personally. As promoted by its creators and implemented publicly in Montana, Gracious Space is most often viewed as a means to create community-based solutions in large groups or on thorny problems. When I mentioned to a leader in Montana that I would be talking about Gracious Space in my faith community, her first question was, what problem in the congregation do you need to solve? I explained that I was thinking in more personal or individual terms, where I believe the foundations of gracious space can serve us just as well. But it's complicated. Every religion seems to take as an article of faith that we're right. Sometimes even, we're right, damn it. I have to say that even Unitarian Universalism seems to operate on that basis. When we talk or sing of community, we tend to think narrowly of a community of people much like ourselves. We'll invite previously marginalized communities if they share our principles, but that's it. When I went looking for a hymn or reading about inviting strangers, I didn't really find anything open enough for gracious space. I am proud of our visions and our values that our songs and sayings express, but for all our talk of welcoming, we don't seem to be any more open to strangers who challenge us than most other groups are, especially challenging us politically and socially, and maybe at an individual level. There is one more point I want to make, and I beat my brains out trying to figure out a natural transition to it. I couldn't quite, so I'm just going to tack on this instance of having been pushed to unfreeze my certainty, even though it may be a little bit of a di digression. At Thanksgiving, I was talking with my stepdaughter, Julie, who works in public health in Kansas. She had been doing a lot of work on rural poverty, especially as it affects health. Poor white people in rural America have health outcomes as bad as some communities of color. In fact, on some measures, white men with only secondary education fare worse than some black or Latinx groups. Perhaps some of you heard Angus Deaton speak at Montana State a few years ago about the deaths of despair. Google it, deaths of despair, and you'll see some distressing statistics. A couple of months ago, I read Brian Alexander's book called The Hospital, Life, Death, and Dollars in a Small American Town, about a small independent hospital struggling to serve the mostly working poor in a community in northwestern Ohio. He described the situation of many of those people. Too many people in Williams County were being used the way mining companies used coal in West Virginia. Human beings were being mined. They were the object of an extractive industry. They were mined for their labor and their money. The modern American version of capitalism encouraged, even demanded, that employers extract the value from their employees while returning scraps to them and their communities. And then professionals questioned why poor and working class people didn't take care of themselves. My daughter Julie took this information into the political sphere. She said, some of the people who say all lives matter may really be saying, what about me? Doesn't my life matter? Let that sink in. Yes, many people brandish the All Lives Matter slogan, especially alongside their loyalty to the blue line of law enforcement with undeniably racist intent. But there are also a lot of poor, less educated white people who don't see evidence that their lives matter. Some liberals, with their eyes on grander prizes, especially political power, may not think that those hicks in flyover country matter at all. Progressives need to speak to them, not with the all lives matter cop out, but by saying things like, yes, your life does matter. That's why we need to control drug prices so you can afford your insulin, and so on and so forth. Thank you for indulging that little side trip. Julie's insight about that feeling of don't I matter was one of the more obvious unfreezings of my certainty recently, especially about rural white guys. Gracious space by itself can't make our health care system more rational and sustainable, but it does have successes. 
I don't know that Gracious Space was specifically part of the work to develop the Salish Kootenai Water Compact, but the result certainly fits the Gracious Space process. And Gracious Space has been implemented in similar settings in Montana, especially in Northwest Montana. Can Gracious Space as a personal practice make me more effective? I don't know. But I'll keep trying, or trying to try it, in the hope that at least it keeps me from making things worse. As the poem Neil shared yesterday, and I thank him for sharing it, as it, include, as it concludes, sometimes all it takes is a single lit candle in the darkness to start a movement. And that led me to one of my favorite readings in our hymnal by Edward Everett Hale. And feel free to murmur along if you remember it. I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. So I hope we can all take at least one step into gracious space, whether it's as easy as clearing off a chair for a visitor or as hard as learning in public. <laughs>